This is the 34th video in a series that I'm making to support a course in elementary number theory. And I'm pretty sure this is the next to last video. So I already wrapped up my course with the previous video, but I thought I would add two videos to this playlist so that we could prove the Thame Rogers Ramanujan identity. Now, some of you guys might know that I started a series a long time ago with the aim of pr proving this identity, but I never got around to finishing it. Well, it turns out that I think this playlist is a better place to finish it because I've covered all of the necessary information, and I think every done, everything is done a little bit more nicely. Before we get into the major goal of this video, I want to recall a few things and look at some examples. So let's recall a partition of n named lambda is a k-tuple. This partition is said to have k parts if it satisfies two conditions. So it's non-increasing. So in other words, lambda one is bigger than or equal to lambda two, which is bigger than or equal to lambda three, all the way down to lambda k. And I should really include here that lambda k is bigger than or equal to one. So these portions are made up of natural numbers. And then furthermore, we have lambda one plus lambda two, all the way up to lambda k is equal to n. Now let's recall that generating functions are an important tool for studying partitions and coming up with partition identities, as we've seen in previous videos. And so if we set p of n equal to the number of unrestricted partitions of n, that's sometimes called the partition function, then the generating function for p of n, sometimes called p of q, so that's going to be the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of p of n q to the n, where we take p of 0 to be 1, that's equal to this infinite product of things that look like sums of geometric series. So the product is m goes from 1 up to infinity of 1 over 1 minus q to the m. And we had some notation in previous videos using this thing called the Pockhammer symbol that allowed us to write this as this q in parentheses with an infinity. Now, before we get into the main goal of the video, I want to recall why this generating function works. So if we take this sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of p of n q to the n and write it out as the product, so we've got 1 over 1 minus q, 1 over 1 minus q squared, 1 over 1 minus q cubed, and so on and so forth forever, then each of these portions of our rational function or our infinite product give us certain things related to the partitions. So this 1 over 1 minus q controls the parts of each partition that are equal to 1. This 1 over 1 minus q squared term controls parts of the partition that are equal to 2. And what I mean by parts, that's these individual things that are making up the partition. And then 1 over 1 minus q cubed, those are parts that are equal to 3. Furthermore, if we expand each of these as geometric series, which you should really think about these as being expanded as geometric series, that's the more proper way to view this infinite product we can see a little bit more of what's going on. So for instance, this one over one minus Q, we can think of it as expanding to one plus Q to the first, Q to the one plus one, Q to the one plus one plus one. And each of these controls how many parts of the partition are equal to one. So this number one here corresponds to not using one at all in the partition. This corresponds to a single part, which is equal to 1. Here we have two parts equal to 1, three parts equal to 1. And then we've got similar rules for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on and so forth. So this q squared corresponds to one portion of the partition equal to 2. This q to the 2 plus 2 is two parts equal to 2. And then, well, that continues on. So let's look at some examples real quick, just to recall maybe how these things are built. Let's find the generating function for partitions where all of the parts are congruent to 1 or 4 mod 5. Let's first recall that being congruent to 1 or 4 mod 5 means that we are of the form 5m plus 1 or 5m plus 4, where m is bigger than or equal to 0. 
but m could be anything bigger than or equal to zero. So keeping in mind that these types of rational functions control what parts we're using, we can write down a generating function pretty easily and it would look like this. One over one minus q to the one power. That would be using a part that is equal to one. One over one minus q to the fourth power. That would be parts equal to four. And then the next number that is one mod five is six. So that's what we would have next. One over one minus q to the six. Those are using parts that are six. The next number would be nine because that is four mod five. So one over one minus q to the nine. And that's gonna end up being an infinite product because there are infinitely many numbers that are congruent to one or four mod five. We could end up writing this as the product as m goes from zero up to infinity of one over one minus q to the five m plus one times one minus q to the five m plus four. And there's a simplified way to write that down using our paw camera symbol, which I'll have come on the screen right now. Now we could do something else. Let's say we wanted to find the generating function for partitions where the parts are used at most twice. Then instead of thinking about the rational function, we wanna think about its expanded form. So only using them twice means that we cannot include anything past this point because this q to the one plus one plus one corresponds to using the number one three times. And then furthermore, everything past this point corresponds to using the number two three or more times and then so on and so forth like this. So that means instead of an infinite product of geometric series, we have an infinite product of just polynomials. So here we'll have one plus q plus q squared. I'll write it as q squared instead of q to the one plus one. So that corresponds to using one, zero, one, or two times. And then we'll have one plus q squared plus q to the fourth. That corresponds to using two, zero, one, or two times. One plus q cubed plus q to the six, and then so on and so forth. Okay, well, we could write that with a product notation as the product as m goes from zero up to infinity of, or maybe we should go from one up to infinity in this case, I think it'll be written down a little bit nicer. Then we'll have one plus q to the m plus q to the two m. So this portion would be like using a part which is equal to m zero times, one time, or two times. Now there's a nice identity that I assigned to my class which allows us to write this object in another form which represents partitions where the pot parts are congruent to one or two mod three. That's, so that's a pretty famous result. I'll let you guys try that on your own if you're interested. Okay, so now that we've got this kind of review under control, let's see what our main goal for the video is. So our major goal for this video will be to find a generating function for a certain type of restricted partition. But that restricted partition is not quite as simple as the ones that we just looked at. In particular, we wanna find the generating function for partitions of n where adjacent parts differ by at least two. So just as an example, although you could easily write down a lot of other examples, and I urge you to, to get a feel for what these look like. If n equals nine, we have five total partitions that satisfy this rule. So the first one will be nine. Well, that has a single part, but that means there's no adjacent part to have this difference condition. So we're good to go there. So the next one is eight plus one, eight and one clearly differ by at least two. Seven plus two, six plus three are the other ones that have length two. So notice the next one kind of in this vein would be five plus four, but the difference between five and four is not at least two. So we go down to a partition of length three and that would be five plus three plus one. So notice that sums to nine and there's a difference of two between each one. And this represents all such partitions that satisfy this rule. Okay, so now that we've got an idea of the goal, I need to define a couple of functions which will be helpful as we work towards this goal. So the two functions that we'll need for our goal are defined like this. 
So I've called them f of mn and f hat of mn. So f of mn is the number of partitions of n into m parts that differ by at least two. So maybe if you're having trouble figuring out what this means, look back at our example for n equals nine and notice that m could be equal to one, two, or three in that case. If m was bigger than three, then we would get zero for this. Okay, and then f hat of mn has the same condition as this one up here. In other words, it's partitions of n into m parts that differ by at least two, but in this case, none of the parts are equal to one. So that means the smallest possible part here is equal to two. And then since we're looking for generating functions, I will define two two variable generating functions based off of f and f hat. So I've called them capital F and capital F hat. So capital F of XQ is the sum over M and N, so it's a double sum. F evaluated at M, N, X to the M, Q to the N. So our X variable is counting the number of parts, and our N variable is counting the partition that we're looking at. And then F hat of XQ is defined similarly just with F hat here. So remember, our goal is to find the generating functions for parts like this, and so that would be related to this pink box here. So we'll start with the following proposition. It has two parts and it's some sort of recursion between these two functions. So we've got f of mn is equal to f hat mn plus f hat m minus one n minus m. And then the second one is f hat mn is equal to f mn n minus m. Okay, so let's see how this proof goes. And I think maybe the best approach to this proof is like kind of visual. So let's start up here and say that this box contains all partitions of n with m parts that differ by at least two. So by the definition of our function over here, we know exactly how many elements are in this box. So there are f, m, n elements in this box by the definition of f, m, n. And then looking up at our goal, we see that we want to separate this number f, m, n into two pieces. So that means we should probably take each of the elements in this box and naturally partition them into two, maybe like sub boxes, we could call it. So I'll bring one down here to the left and one down here to the right. And let's see, how should we do this? Well, obviously we should do this in a way so that one of them contains f hat m n elements and the other one contains that many elements. Well, it turns out it's easy to do this one. So notice that these will be partitions of n with m parts differing by bigger than or equal to two, and then here not equal to one. That's like the definition of this f hat m n. So that means there are f hat m n elements in this box. Okay, so we can't just write this next one down, but what we can do is talk about what is not in this orange box, and that's exactly what we'll do. So let's go over here, and we'll describe the complement of this orange box. So this will be partitions of n into m parts that differ by bigger than or equal to two, and they include the number one. So that means each partition in this box has the number one as the first part. Notice it can only be the first part if it satisfies this rule. So I would suggest a nice doable exercise would be to pick a value of n and m and fill all of these boxes in. Okay, so now what can we do? We want to somehow translate these types of partitions into partitions that are being counted by this function. And that's not too hard. So what we'll do is subtract one from each part. Okay, 
So that means that we're eliminating the last part and then we are decreasing n by m. Okay, so let's see what effect that will have. So that will assign each partition up here to a partition of n minus m. Well, why did we have to subtract m here? I just said we subtract one. We're, well, we are subtracting one from each part and there are m total parts. So that means all together we're subtracting m. And then furthermore, because we're subtracting from each part, they still differ by at least two. But now since one was definitely one of the parts up here and we subtracted one from each part, that means we have decreased the number of parts by one. So this is partitions of n minus m into m minus one parts. And then since we subtracted one from every part, this rule is still satisfied. So in other words, all of these differ by at least two. The parts differ by at least two. So I think it goes without saying, or maybe it's a pretty easy thing to see, that this sets up a one-to-one -one relationship between the elements in each of these boxes. So now all we have to do is count how many guys are in this box. But that's not too hard because we've got a function that counts that exactly. And that is f n minus m, m minus one. In other words, partitions of n minus m into m minus one parts. But notice we almost have everything we need to build this equation. We just need a hat over this. So how can we argue that there's a hat over this? In other words, that none of these parts include one. Well, that's not actually that hard because here every partition includes the number one, which means the second smallest part is bigger than or equal to three. So when we subtract one from each part, the smallest part down here will be bigger than or equal to two. So it will not include one. So by those rules I've just said, that means we can put a hat over this. But now what we've done is created some sort of disjoint union of our set at the top into these two sets here, which have f hat m n and f hat n minus m, m minus one elements, whereas our original set had f of m n elements. So that builds this first equation. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this and then we will build the second equation. We just got done proving this first equation. Now we're ready to prove this second equation. So let's see how we can do this. We'll do a similar strategy where I make a box where I put all of the partitions of a certain type. So I wanna count up the number of partitions that this function represents first. So these will be partitions of n minus m with m parts. And maybe this goes without saying because this is the whole world that we're living in in this video, but these parts differ by at least two. So how many elements are in this box? Well, there are exactly f, m, n minus m elements in this box. Okay, what will we do here? Well, we're gonna do a similar transformation to what we did on the last board. So I'm gonna set up this one-to-one -one correspondence, which is generated by adding one to each part of every partition in this box. Okay, so let's see what effect that will have. So that's gonna give us partitions of n, n instead of n minus m, because we've added one to each of the m parts. So in the congregate, we have added m, and then, but we have not changed the number of parts. So this is still with m parts. They still differ by at least two. And furthermore, since one was the smallest possible part here, the smallest possible part down here is one plus one. So that means these don't include the number one. Okay, but now we can easily count up the number of partitions in this box, and it's exactly what we want it to be. It's f hat m n. Now we're gonna take this result and write a generating function version of it. In other words, a version of it that involves these capital F and F hat functions. We just got done proving a nice recursion for these functions little f and little f hat. 
And now we want to look at a generating function version of those recursions. So we've got this first one, capital F of XQ is equal to capital F hat of XQ plus XQ capital F hat of XQ Q. And then the second one, F hat XQ is equal to F XQ Q. So let's start with this first one. And as we'll see, these follow pretty quickly from the recursions that we just got done proving. So we'll start with the left-hand side of this. So we have f of xq is equal to our sum over mn of f of mn x to the m q to the n. Nice. Now we'll I'll apply our first recursion to this little f mn. So that's going to give us this sum as m and n go between 0 and infinity, although I'm leaving that off, of f hat mn plus f hat m minus 1 n minus m. Then we've got x to the m q to the n like that. Now we're going to split this into two parts. So that's going to give us this sum as m and n go between 0 and infinity. f hat m n x m q to the n. So notice that is already our generating function capital F hat. And then we've got the rest of this. So that's going to be plus our sum over m and n of f hat m minus 1 n minus m x to the m q to the n. So like I said, this guy right here looks exactly like our f hat generating function already. So I'll just rewrite this as f hat x q. And then we can get to work on this other bit, which will require a little bit of re-indexing. So let's see how we might want to re-index this. Well, I think probably our best bet will to send m to m plus 1. So in other words, we're going to replace all of the m's with m plus 1's. And then what should we do with the n's? Well, we're going to send all of the n's to n plus m. Now, you might be a little bit worried about what's happening kind of at the lower end here because we have to change the starting point. But I'll let you guys think about why that is not a problem. We're essentially just counting and leaving out a bunch of zeros. So how does that allow us to rewrite this guy? That allows us to rewrite this guy as the sum over mn of f hat mn, and then we'll have x to the m plus 1, q to the m plus 1 plus n. Now what we'll do is factor some stuff out of this and rewrite it a little bit. So this is going to be x times q times our sum over mn of f hat mn. And then what's left over after we factor that bit out? So we, we will have x times q all to the m power. I've put those together just because that's what's being clued into us over there. And then we will have q to the n power. But let's notice that if we were to rewrite this using our f hat generating function, it would be exactly this term right here. So that means we have proven this first identity. And then maybe this second one is a nice one that could be left as a little bit of a homework exercise. It follows pretty similarly. Okay, so now we've got everything in place to achieve our goal. Now we're ready to prove our goal, and that is the generating function for partitions with this restriction. So we've got f of 1q is equal to the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of q to the n squared, and then this pock hammer symbol qn. So recall that's a product of n objects in the denominator. You might say, well, what's this 1 here? Well, the 1 allows us to count the number of partitions without worrying about this restriction on the number of parts. I'll let you guys think about that a little bit. Okay, so let's get to the proof. So from the previous proposition, we can put those two portions of the proposition together into this single equation. f of xq is equal to f of xq q plus xq times f of xq squared q. So let's recall that the part that we proved had something with hats over here on the right hand side, but the part that I left as homework would allow you to translate those into just the standard f's without the hats. 
Okay, so next we're going to assume that we have the following expansion. So f of x q is equal to the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of a n times x to the n. So those a n's are going to all depend on q. And I want to point out that it's not too hard to see that a zero should be equal to one. Well, that would be like the number of partitions with zero parts, but we take things like that to be equal to one generally. Okay, so now we'll plug this expansion into our recursion or our difference equation up here, and that will give us the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of a n x to the n equals the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of a n times q to the n x to the n plus x times q times the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of a n. And then let's see what we've got here. We've got q to the two n and then x to the n. So we've got something like that. So next, I'm gonna take this x times q and bring it in, and we can bring it in by adding one to each of these exponents. So we have q to the n plus one and x to the n plus one. Next up, I will re-index this sum so that my x has an nth power. So I can do that by sending n to n minus one. So that means n plus one will be, well, n minus one plus one, which is just n. Okay, so let's see what effect that has. So that's gonna give us the sum of a sub n minus one, q to the two n minus one. That's the effect if we replace n with n minus one, and then x to the n. But now this is just going to be the sum as n goes from one to infinity because of our changed index. Next up, we can see that the only two constant terms in x are equal to one, and they occur in this sum right here and this sum right here. So we can subtract a zero from both sides, and that will change this from a starting point of zero to a starting point of one, and likewise over there. So we're running out of room. So what I'll do on the next board is rewrite this thing that I've underlined in yellow, and I'll probably push these two sums together. So after pushing the sums together on the last board, we have the following. So the sum of a n x to the n is the sum of a n q n, a n minus one q to the two n minus one x to the n. So now we can equate coefficients of x to the n on both sides of the equation, and we've got this nice recursion for a sub n. So let's see what we've got. We've got a sub n um, minus a sub n q to the n is equal to a n minus one q to the two n minus one after moving this thing over here. Next, we can factor an a sub n out of the left hand side. That'll leave us with a sub n one minus q to the n is equal to a n minus one q to the two n minus one. That tells us that a n is equal to q to the two n minus one over one minus q to the n times a n minus one. And now we can just iterate this recursion. So we can replace a n minus one with q to the two n minus three over one minus q to the n minus one, and then we'll have a sub n minus two. And then likewise, we can replace a n minus two with another term times a n minus three. And we can do that all the way down until we get a zero, which is one. And then we'll have q to the one over one minus q, like that. But now let's see. We can multiply that together. Notice if we multiply the denominator together, we get exactly that q pock hammer symbol, which is up here. Then if we multiply that numerator together, I claim that we get q to the n squared. You might say, well, why is that? Well, by exponent rules, what we have up here in the numerator is q to the 2n minus 1 plus 2n minus 3 plus all the way down to plus 3 plus 1. But it's well known that if you add all of these odd numbers like this, you get n squared.
But now let's notice that we're actually done. If we take this expression for a sub n and put it back up here, then we have actually derived something a little bit stronger than this. And that is that fxq is equal to our sum of qn squared over qn x to the n. But then replacing x with one gives us this, which is the generating function for partitions of n where all of the adjacent parts differ by at least two. And that's a good place to stop.